Box show about hot takes out of the hot tasty pancakes. I'm your wacky host Christian, and I'm joined as always by my two best friends, Chris Conkling. He's the hunk, and Brian Dupree, the cute one. Thank you. If this is your first time listening to Pop Box, what is this crazy show? You know what, boys? I'm gonna be honest. I don't know anymore. I'm not sure where this plane is flying. Uh, but thank you so much. We are flying though, and that's the we important are flying. thing. Are we still in the air to move? We got yes. two engines out. Uh, smoke is billowing. Uh, we're over Nazi Germany in 1943. Oh no! And uh, the sky is like this scenario at all. Black. There's actually zombies now, so we have to worry about that shit. So uh, I think but, this is just the movie Overlord oh, that you're shit, talking about right. now. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Uh, what is this show? Uh, well, this is uh, this is this is something we're doing where we're gonna we're gonna do like a basic movie cast. If you've heard a movie cast, we do the same thing but better and a little different. And uh, you know, we talk about the latest news and then we talk about um, uh, what we've been consuming. This week, we're gonna focus on one movie. A movie that I think is not getting enough attention, 3,000 Years of Longing, which is going to be a very exciting conversation. Uh, we have a poll giveaway. We did a Predator tribute month, and so we're going to have a poll where we give away a copy of Predator, the original, starring starring Chris. Arnie Schwartz. That's correct. Starring the Schwarzenegger. I don't know why you said it that way. That was weird. I don't know either. Yeah. It's, it's weird. very strange. Uh, so yeah, and we I, I loved our Predator Month. Everybody should check that out. We had a lot of fun. We had uh, Brad from You Got to See This on, which is super cool. I'm really proud of that month, um, mostly because I put some work into it. Um, I don't know what you guys were doing. <laughs> I didn't watch any of those movies. Really, just lazing about. To be frank, <laughs> your name is Chris. Come on. So uh, yeah, up to, up up top, we got it. We got a state of the pod. We got, we're gonna give a state of the podcast. Oh, are we? Yeah, I think okay. I think we are. I think we are. Um, so so we we are we are going to be uh, drastically changing some things and maybe introducing some cool stuff. I, I don't want to announce anything that we have half stickly half changing some yes. things. Yeah, we're gonna keep. So what what we what we have done in the past. Your first time listening this is a weird episode to check in on. But uh, you know, hang on. I got chapter markers. If you want to jump to the news go for it you won't hurt my feelings but if you are if you want to go into the changes totally blind and surprised <laughs> just skip to the next chapter marker well i don't want to give away too much of the things that we're planning we got a lot of cool things planned which should be really fun but you know when we started the show it was about us hanging out and uh, talking about all things uh you know what we've what we've been watching and consuming and that was like a huge part of it but we also wanted to like break down stuff even more and so we're gonna we're gonna kind of try to try to live up to that promise by still bringing uh, kind of a, a weekly update, just like this episode you're listening to. But we're the going weekly to, uploads will continue. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the plan. I will not be here. <laughs> Full stop. No. <laughs> I, Christian is taking a hiatus to take care of some things in his personal life. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be taking at least a month off. It, it should be about a month uh we'll, we'll see but for the month of september which is sober september uh mind you as well for me we were for not... listeners who've been with us for the last four years i uh, don't they know I don't... every yeah. september yeah but this this is we're not recording in september <laughs> just as a that means nothing to the context of this episode but it is not september right now it is very much not september at this very moment um but uh yeah no we're gonna we're gonna not have a lot of news for a while on uh on on the other stuff so more to come on that i, I don't want to i don't want to talk too much about that stuff but it will be a little different we'll have the weekly uploads and we'll have brian and chris delivering um that content for at least a month and then um we'll see if i come I'm back. back boys <laughs> yeah. i'm the host taking the reins back <laughs> to be clear it is evident by by the four minutes that i've been talking that you're a much better host i don't know what i'm doing here i don't know what you're a fantastic host, and we love having you as such. You know, you don't think I'm a better producer, maybe? Yeah. 
Uh, I'm not going to unchain your leg from the desk. You need to continue <laughs> being the host. <laughs> you wear multiple hats. Well, yes. Well, yes. I appreciate it. I, I and I, I do want to take the moment to to thank the listeners for sticking with us. Um, we all have uh, jobs and lives and um and, and significant others. And I have a family now. So is and we do this for fun and we do it for all the listeners that listen and we appreciate all the all the support we get. Do you guys want to say anything sentimental? Um, before I. Uh, hit up hit a bump hit a bumper button no i just appreciate everybody who has stuck with us this entire time through all the different iterations and evolutions of the show you know this isn't the first time we've changed the podcast um i'm excited that weekly uploads are going to continue they're going to be uh, a little more chill you know kind of like what we're, we're talking about right now shooting the shit talking about the the most recent news in the industry as well as what we've been consuming but what we're going to be doing moving forward um is is exciting and we're excited to share it with you and it's very much in line with what we wanted the show to be originally so uh we hope that those of you that have stuck with us will continue to stick with us even through all these big changes thank you it's really what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah no i you guys have said it well thank you to everyone watching everyone listening uh it's been a great journey and if you are just joining us and this somehow is your first episode uh you may have a chance sometime soon to look back um so look forward to that as well and yeah, we always that, have our our tbts yeah that we, we can get you caught up on of what how how like the arc of this podcast we, we might have an episode that's going to celebrate us uh we're coming up on our fourth year so mm -hmm. we may have some special stuff planned for that um, but then after that, uh, you know, we'll have the weekly uploads and then hopefully have some updates for you after that. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's stop this, whatever the fuck is happening right now. Um, cause I'm uncomfortable and if I'm uncomfortable, we know we're in a bad place. <laughs> let's start the way that we do on the weekly upload, which is with Brian's Wacky News Corner. Start on wacky, start on wacky. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, the first piece of news this week. Uh, Tessa Thompson and Joseph Gordon-Levitt have signed on to star in Flying Lotus's second feature film, a sci-fi thriller called Ash. Um, Flying Lotus is a um, Grammy Award-winning musician whose first movie premiered just a couple of years ago and I guess has a segment in the latest in the VHS movie series which is um which are anthology shorts um he's got a short in vhs 99 which i actually didn't know was a thing until this news came out so definitely looking forward to that as well i really liked the last one they did vhs 84 that came out last year um and flying lotus i have not seen his first movie which is called kuso i bought it on voodoo a while back when it was on sale and haven't come back to it it got kind of mixed reviews but um it seems like an interesting movie and I know it had some, um, I think it was kind of praised for its effects, even though it may be a bit graphic for some people, but Flying Lotus is a musical artist that is just one of the all time greats. I think um, just absolutely brilliant stuff and seeing him um, stretch into other areas is really exciting because he not only produces music, he also raps. Um, so very talented man. And yeah, looking forward to that. You have Tessa Thompson and Joseph Gordon-Levitt on board. Ridiculous talent who are going to bring people to the theaters, regardless of who's behind the camera. Um, Chris, how do you feel about this? Um, I don't. Have you listened to Flying Lotus at all before? I haven't. I'm really not familiar with any of his work, nor have I seen uh, his first feature film. But the premise of this movie sounds really interesting. It sounds like a really cool sci-fi thriller mystery. Um, and again, you mentioned Tessa Thompson and Joseph Gordon-Levitt just signed on, both of whom are absolutely fantastic talents. Uh, so I think the combination of the two of them, plus this really interesting sci-fi premise, can make for a really interesting flick. It sounds like his first film is definitely more like horror, horror genre based. Um, and I think while this, as I mentioned, is going to be like a like a sci-fi mystery thriller, I think it's still going to have a lot of horror elements to it, most likely. So I'm I'm interested to see what he's able to put together. 
Yeah. And uh, that, real quick, real quick, uh, Flying Lotus is like a jazz hip hop fusion band and they're awesome as sh- shit. They're really great. So um, I, I like I'm getting cowboy bebop vibes from like kind of the ideas that are going on, you know, not so as much. Let me, let me explain the plot here. I'm sorry, Chris. I terrible news, man, tonight. No, um, I know. Brian, your MO is to keep our audience as clean as possible when it comes to spoilers and i appreciate that very much and i too was trying to be vague in genre um yeah because i think we're actually careful for spoilers you know what i mean chris oh my gosh ow i'm certainly not a little salty tonight i'm not salty i'm just saying that we are actually careful about spoilers that's all i said that's all i said Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as an outlet i think diversity that you brian anyway (laughs) This movie follows Tessa Thompson, who wakes up on a distant planet and finds the crew of her space station viciously killed and must then decide if she can trust the man sent to rescue her, which is Joseph Mm Gordon-Levitt. But he starts becoming skeptical of her as well and what actually played out. Um, Definitely an interesting concept. Seems like it could be kind of a a two-hander, maybe a kind of a small movie with big ideas, which is something that I always appreciate. Um, Christian, please go on. Oh, no, I, I, I just think that especially if, if there's kind of the vibe of, you know, this sci-fi, obviously more horror than like noir, but, you know, if, if there's a very similar musical vibe, that would be, I think that would be a really winning combo. That would be sick. And he is also scoring it. Um, Ooh, cool. So, that's good news. Yeah. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt's kind of like Spike Spiegley, you know, he's a little lanky dude. It could be cool. I think that sounds okay. great. As okay. You know, they didn't choose Toe for Grace, which was probably... <laughs> Probably for the better. At least Brad thinks so. I'm the murderer. I love the callbacks. I love the callbacks. <laughs> yeah. For our I'm the mole. dense audience. So yeah, that's uh, Tessa Thompson and Joseph Gordon-Levitt who have fly- signed on to Flying Lotus's second feature film uh, called Ash. The next piece of news. All right. We talked recently about Disney Plus's plans for ad-based um an ad-based level of their streaming platform. Netflix, which we had talked about previously, was planning to do this as well, is planning in the last few months of the year to roll out in a handful of markets a $7 to $9 ad plan. So as we talked about, Disney Plus's plan was $7.99, I believe, which was their standard plan prior. That's now their ad-based plan. So it's going to be right in that same um, right in that same price range. Netflix standard is like fifteen forty nine per month right now. Tell 4K me about it. is over $20, I believe. Um, so I don't know why this feels kind of, uh, there's, there's something about the relative difference here that feels a little more reasonable, even though it is functionally the exact Brian, same. Brian, hold on. This segment's brought to you by Winston Cigarettes. Winston Cigarettes. Nine out of five doctors recommend Winston Cigarettes. When you're not feeling Nine good out of five. or you're feeling great, Winston Cigarettes to really get the day started. All right, back to you, Brian. Dunlop decided they were done with us, so. <laughs> we have many. We have many ads. Hey, sponsors. it's a competitive market for Popaholic sponsors. Oh, one of my lights died. <laughs> Great. So they have said sponsors um, keeping the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> this is not brought to you by Nanlite. Nanlite, their battery life sucks ass. Brian, Christian loves these lights. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we talked about how Disney Plus, um, in their first advert, in in their first um, in their announcements about this, talked about the sorts of advertisements that they would allow. Um, they wouldn't have political stuff, I believe, and there wouldn't be ads in children's content, I believe, mm-hmm. or limited ads. Um, Netflix reportedly will have four minutes of commercials per hour um, during, but not after. Before, right. during, but not after. Um, I will say sometimes Hulu, they haven't done it recently. Sometimes they'll hook you with the ad before the credit break. It's a real, it's a real shifty move, Hulu. I'll just be honest. Um, <laughs> but I didn't fall for it again. <laughs> um, getting very personal, and I apologize here. But um, I think four minutes per hour seems very reasonable for for the first level. I got to imagine at some point this is going to expand. But the amount of money to be made at this point um, is already huge. They're talking about giant um, billions to be made per year by 2027. I think. Um, so this is the rollout of the future. Christian, let's start with you. 
How do you feel about Netflix rolling this out? The price point. Um, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think what what Netflix needs to do is really break some new barriers. What they need to do is they need to take all their shows, okay, and just have them playing simultaneously, okay? They need to break those shows up into, I don't know what you call them, but different like lines uh, where things happen at the same time. It's like time. the architect in the matrix. Yeah, yeah so exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. And you break it up in different lines and uh, you get this like guide and everything's playing at like a certain time and you kind of click through and you could number these lines of content. And uh, yeah, you could uh, you could also add on different parts to it. I, I think I think they really are innovating here, uh, and this is really why technology companies are the best at doing everything, and we should trust everything to them. So yeah, no, it's good. I, I like it. No, fu- I fucking hate ads, and I thought we were supposed to get away from them. I thought we were done with them. I thought I paid you ten dollars. I don't watch ads, and they they messed up because they made too much bullshit that sucks. And uh, now I gotta watch ads again or pay a crazy amount of money it was all fake it sounds that they haven't raised at this point they haven't further raised their port uh prices uh, with this and um i didn't say they're gonna fully roll this out next year i believe or that's the plan at this point yeah no they're i'm rolling a- it out in a couple select markets like in in winter it's so really, november right. I mean, december they're gonna be testing it out at this point chris i mean you like stranger things but you you would sub and watch and binge it and be like i'm out like you know you'd be smart like that but i got my wife would let me i would yeah i got this wife to be that loves the fucking shit that's like oh it's uh, there she was 15 and she was murdered and now here's 15 episodes with grainy videotape and a lot of talking heads and this angle by the way this angle right here this is the angle i've watched a lot of netflix docs and it's like this angle where she's like yeah I couldn't believe what happened. That angle, I know for audio listeners that didn't work for you, but it's the angle where it's like right above your head and that's when they want to say something really serious and it's like the nose pointing forward and they're like, no, look forward, don't look at the camera. You need a good, you need a good bob. That's the head bob angle. It's like yeah. nodding, yeah. solemn uh, discussion. So I think Netflix knows that my fiance won't let me cancel this shit. And so I'm just gonna have to pay and I, and I won't watch ads. So that now was I got the last pay email they sent you. It's it's yeah. getting kind of on the nose at this point. Yeah, they just send her like eighteen new murder docs on the way. Uh, the woman who could have been um, <laughs> is premiering next month, and uh, they're like, "You still want four K and no ads?" And I'm like, "Of course I want four K and no ads. I don't watch anything on your phone." There's no going back, Netflix. Yeah, I've had a taste. All these docs are in four K, and what I realized I'm paying for is just screensavers because, like, all the good four K content and all this shit is just drone photography, where they're like L A. and it's just like a beautiful, it's a great, <laughs> beautiful screensaver of L A. and I'm like, oh yeah, four K, good shit, yeah, yeah, twenty five. You know what's gonna be, you know, what's gonna be the hardest pill to swallow, Christian, hmm. is when Netflix four uh, K rentals come back. And we'll, that. <laughs> we'll send you a disc in the yeah. mail. <laughs> like we're revolutionizing the game. We're going to put all the content on a circular Frisbee and you're going to plug it into your Netflix box. It'll be great. Also Here's has ads. Do. Also has <laughs> unskippable. Right. Ads. They're going to, they're going to utilize your solution, which is air all of their content at select times over the course of the day. So you have to schedule your life around. You have to put the right airing. disc in to see and the then, content at that time. <laughs> then if you can't schedule your life around the times at which all these programs are airing, they're going to offer a physical disc solution <laughs> where you select the season disc that you want and they mail it to you it sounds excellent all powered by uh, a blu-ray live or whatever it's called that stupid oh, no. the thing that you definitely should turn off if you watch physical yeah. media it's like do you want us to take over your dvd and show you shit you don't care about we're gonna interrupt the show and show you <laughs> this uh storyboard about the scene that you should have been watching but we're also not going to pause the scene so you're gonna miss the entire <laughs> thing while we show you the production of it. and do you want to select a menu option is it highlighted or is it bolder I don't know. You don't know. Have fun. <laughs> what a tangent. Oh, my God. Right, yes, Chris, Chris what do you think about the, uh, the the ad-based future? That is also I agree past. with you that I'm, I'm not happy to be going back to ad-based stuff. But as we mentioned a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Disney+, Plus, this streaming business model just was not sustainable. So when we initially entered into, the, into these streaming wars, even before that... Uh, it seemed like a content and media utopia 
that we were just blind to what was actually taking place. There was no way these companies could have sustained this, especially Netflix, because they don't have any other revenue streams. All of these other companies that have entered the streaming war recently have uh, plenty of other revenue streams for them to draw from. Netflix is solely this streaming company. So while I'm not pleased that we're going back to this, I think there actually are a lot of positives to be found within this new advertising tier. I think a lot of the people, you know, they're, they're rolling out their, their new plan to minimize people sharing passwords and sharing accounts. I think a lot of those people are going to end up enrolling in the 799 plan. It's not incredibly expensive and they, while they're going to have to watch ads, they'll have access to all the content. Not only that, moving forward, advertisers are going to be able to select probably which pieces of content they want their ads to be in, which means this horrible system where Netflix cancels shows after great shows after three seasons because they're no longer bringing in more subscribers. Like if, if I don't want this to happen, everybody who watches the Sandman is also the demographic that buys Mercedes Benz. Like, so well, it's going like, to be the Sandman's a perfect <laughs> example, though. Take that as an example. So even despite Sandman doing so well and being in the top 10 for Netflix over the last couple of weeks, because it's such an expensive show and because Netflix is wholly reliant on subscribers, that's literally the only way they make money. People who are already subscribed to Netflix watching Sandman, they don't give a fuck about. What they care about is the people who are subscribing to Netflix and the first thing that they're watching is Sandman. Because then they know, hey, this person specifically subscribed to Netflix to watch this show. Maybe we should back its budget and make more of it. So I think that this ad tier is going to be great because these, these advertisers can pay money to pump ads into Sandman and feed its budget. So yeah, instead yeah, yeah, of Sandman yeah, yeah, yeah. getting canceled in Chris, season two. <laughs> Chris, can I put on my Which has not happened and hopefully won't happen. Hopefully can, not. Can I put on my tech? It will be shopped around though, if that is the Can case. I put on my tech business boy hat on for a second? Please do, please uh, do, um, please do. So here's the big problem. Is that, uh, who, who's the best at video and, and ad content at the moment? Video plus ads, who does it the best? Facebook, I don't know. Who? T Fa TikTok? Uh, there's YouTube. one more. YouTube! Google, run by this giant network of the last 30 years of user input data. And Netflix, who has been flying on the seat of their pants, running on empty for the last uh, 10 years, 10, 15 years, they're suddenly going to become good at advertisement and please advertise. Like, that is another fucking business. It's another whole goddamn business. I'm not saying it's going to happen immediately. Think... What I'm saying is it, it will happen eventually. I'm not saying it's impossible. And Brian, I do want you to continue. I do want your input. But I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying, like, I don't think a lot of people are thinking about how hard it is to run an ads-based business when you have not run that before. Your advertisers have to be happy and your consumers have to be happy. And you have to, like, input the ads right when they show up, how often they show up, how long are they, how loud are they. Like, I'm sorry. They've never done this before. It's, yeah. it's. I get where you're coming from. Yeah, Brian. I just think it's a possibility in the future. Oh yeah, no. All of those are definitely very valid points. I just feel like with the algorithmic system that they've got and the sort of stuff that they're doing already, plus, um, you know, for most of their content, if you look into the genres or look into comparable stuff on television, it's not like there aren't indicators that you can, you know, kind of take a lot of data from or just obviously hire a third party company to to handle that sort of thing for you. But they did, your, I your believe point about all the infrastructure that needs to be built or, or built yeah. around to sustain the ads. Right. Is, is, they did hire a third a party company. Do you know who's handling Netflix's ad service? Microsoft Microsoft. Oh, okay. They've never done an ad based service either. It's fucking ridiculous. Okay. They have Bing. Right, well. They have Bing. Yeah, Bing. It's going to be the Bing of ad service. Dude, it's going to be fucking terrible. We'll see I, how it goes. I honestly, we'll how it think goes. It's, I honestly think it's going to be the downfall, unless they can really figure it out. It's not going to be good, but uh, that's just my opinion. Christian thinks this is the end for Netflix. We'll see uh, as the year goes on and they roll out wide next year with their uh, 7 to $9 uh, approximately according uh, uh reportedly uh ad based tier i just think Look, we got a whole lot stranger more. things is over ozark is over what there's no new original netflix content other than the sandman 
uh they can close shop now i think <laughs> like they're gonna have another completely unremarkable 200 million dollar movie coming down the pipe soon <laughs> just you wait uh <laughs> will smith is oh an gosh. elf um attorney <laughs> on the moon <laughs> and it's good it's gonna really uh break down um you know it's gonna fix racism i think so one can only hope the last piece of news proper i can't remember chris did you bring up this when it was just a rumor so recently on during, on the air or was that just a, an off mic conversation during one of our breaks yes okay. uh brad brought this up when, when it was brian just a was frozen on our zoom call it wow. may have been yes it may have been but yeah we were talking about it off mic last week that this was a uh, rumor at the time and not officially before, actually yeah. before big sites were actually reporting on it but um the director of wandavision as well as uh it's always sunny in philadelphia as well as episodes of game of thrones has uh matt shackman has signed on to direct fantastic four so john watts who had helmed the most recent spider-man trilogy in the mcu was signed on to direct this previously and had stepped down and matt shackman took over um i think this guy has a pretty remarkable track record even not having seen game of thrones from everything i hear he's directed some of the better episodes um in in the series yeah and i like his episodes from season seven the, several of them are, are probably some of the best episodes of that season okay okay yeah as loyal listeners will know i uh have not seen much True. game of thrones <laughs> at all so i can't speak to it completely but um fantastic four is scheduled to kick off phase six of the mcu and it's currently set for nova november 8th 2024 but there's no way that date holds and if the mcu <laughs> goes how how it tends to go but we hope that it will happen then um apparently matt shackman had signed on to direct the latest star trek film as well which is scheduled to come out in december of 2023 and it's unclear if he's still involved with that he stepped away he did mm -hmm. oh interesting okay it's a big pile of gold uh two roads robert frost one had a giant um big pile of gold the other did not so he, he went with the gold which is the gold being for. marvel studios yeah yeah, that's right instead of star trek so the fantastic four obviously uh marvel's first family is this this is a thing yeah. um from 1961 this goes way back um people have been wanting them in the mcu for a long time in in a solid iteration i know um when i saw the first two movies that were associated with marvel pre-mcu i enjoyed them at the time uh coming back to them i I don't know if they're good movies, but um, they're not. I'm excited for them to take another swing at this. There's no official casting out. There is, of course, speculation based on some of the cameo appearances that have happened in other MCU movies that I'm not going to mention right here to avoid um, spoilers, but nothing about the, the cast yet. But Mac Sha Matt Shackman being tied to this, I think, is a, a strong sign um, and definitely hopeful after John Watts having stepped down. Um, Chris. You're obviously familiar with Shackman. Um, I also, it's always sunny. Just I, I, one of our favorite comedy incredible sitcoms, stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorite comedies. Um, how do you feel about this news? I think this is really good news. You know, he I don't believe he's directed any feature films before. I, is this I think this might be his first one. Um, but like Brian mentioned, he's done a ton of great television. WandaVision in and of itself is basically a six hour movie. You know, when it comes to the Marvel productions, they're very much led like feature films. So he has a lot of experience in this genre already. You know, he's going to be Fantastic Four is going to be under the exact same company, Marvel Studios. But I, I think this is exciting news. You know, I was talking with the the C4S Villains crew a couple of days ago about this news, and I was telling them how I'm excited for a Fantastic Four movie to finally be made out of love because literally every Fantastic Four movie that's ever been made was made solely to retain the rights to the property. Fox and even the studio prior to Fox getting the rights, they were always making a movie because they realized that the rights were about to relapse. So finally, we're going to get a Fantastic Four movie under its home banner. As you mentioned, Brian, they are Marvel's first family. 
Fantastic Four issue one is literally the reason Stan Lee is Stan Lee. Without that first issue, he never would have created the Marvel comic universe. Um, and, and for those that don't know that story, I highly recommend uh, looking it up because it's it's a it's a great story. But I think this is good news. I'm excited to see what Matt, Matt Shackman does. There's a really cool shot in WandaVision towards the end of the show where we have like the entire WandaVision family in their hero poses that gave me very much like incredible vibes when I saw it when it first aired. And as you know, the Incredibles are essentially like the best Fantastic Four movie that's ever been made. <laughs> so I think he can pull this off and I'm excited to see what he what he's able to do. I think he can too, um, especially him being a superhero himself. You know, if Hollywood needs a hero, it's, uh, you know, with their homeless problem, it's Shaq Man. Oh, no. Where's the sliding whistle? Bring it out. <laughs> that's, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, moving into some stuff that's coming out this week. Uh, coming to Netflix, we have Narco Saints. This will be out this Friday. It is a South Korean series directed and co-written by Yoon Jung Min, uh, excuse me, Yoon Jong Bin. And it's based on true events. It depicts an ordinary entrepreneur who has no choice but to risk his life in joining the secret mission of government agents to capture a Korean drug lord operating in Suriname, Suriname. Apologize about pronunciation for all of this. Um, uh, not much coming out with t on TV this week. Netflix continuing to uh, give us kind of global content that seems to be doing well for them. And that is always appreciated, just getting more diverse things. Um, this is based on a true story as well. Looks like it's going to, as many of these things do, probably take some um, leeway with the actual true things and, and embellish. But um, yeah, Narco Saints looks like uh, a cool one for a week that doesn't have much TV coming out. Um, that's Narco Saints on Netflix. We got a lot of movies coming out this week. Pinocchio is coming to Disney Plus, one of the two Pinocchios that's coming out this year. This is the one directed by Robert Zemeckis, which is pseudo live action co-written by Robert Zemeckis and Chris Weitz. Um, it's an adaptation of the 1940 movie of the same name, which itself is based on the 1883 book by Carlo Collodi. This stars Tom Hanks, Cynthia Erivo, Giuseppe Battistone, Luke Evans, Ben Ainsworth, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Keegan-Michael Key um, in live action and voice roles, and uh, follows Pinocchio in an Italian vid village who's brought to life by the blue fairy and seeks the life and adventure the life of adventure while striving to be a real boy um this looks as i said kind of like it's going to be a kind of straightforward adaptation of the original um movie i think that movie is probably just over an hour long i don't think pinocchio the original is very long so i got to imagine this is probably going to be expanded to some degree um this just in brian they've added 12 new songs to this live action <laughs> adaptation making it clock in at just under two and a half hours <laughs> yes yeah exactly um i'm not sure okay so it is listed as a musical fantasy film so got to imagine some of the some of the key tracks are going to be there but if it's like lion king they really didn't add much plot at all to lion king but somehow expanded the the length i was a little surprised by that one um but well, they had to make room for the real lions uh shitting in in the savannah it was a real strain on production getting that out of the view of the camera it's a stinky <laughs> set <laughs> oh boy uh but back to you Chris, brian this, yeah, movie looks, yeah. this movie looks That's, horrible it looks like shit i saw the trailer i, I saw the trailer in the theater for the movie we're gonna talk about later and uh, yeah, it, it, it didn't oh, really? seem real. Okay. It seemed like a parody of a movie that you'd make. It was really bad. But yeah. I don't every... think it's going to be that bad. Tom uh, Hanks is Geppetto. I mean, Tom Hanks. Yeah, doing Come an on. accent. Come on. He's going to be doing. He's, he's Tom Hanks, but. He's you know, every I'm not, man. I'm he's not, not sure. Italian man. All right. Let's be honest. 
I'm not particularly interested in checking this out. I'm kind of checked out of all the live action adaptations of these animated classics. But I am, I might sc scrub through the movie to see some of the more darker, or some of the darker sequences from the original Pinocchio film. Because there, there are some pretty dark uh, elements to that original movie. We'll, we'll see how they're adapted. <laughs> That's not funny. Why am I laughing? I don't know. Boys uh, turning into donkeys, like screaming for their mothers. The scene where uh, Geppetto, horrifying. The scene horrifying. where Geppetto's at the doctor's office, and he's like, "How did you get a splinter on your dick?" <laughs> oh, no. oh, so dark. God. So dark. Oh no. <laughs> That's Pinocchio coming to Disney Plus this Friday. <laughs> uh, we also have coming to theaters this Friday, Barbarian. Uh, this is the story follows a young woman who discovers the rental home she booked is already occupied by a stranger against her better judgment. She decides to spend the night there, but soon discovers there may be more to fear, more to fear than just an unexpected house guest. Um, this stars Georgina Campbell, Bill Skarsgård, and Justin Long, and is written and directed by Zach Kreger, who is one of the founding members of the whitest kids, you know, a, um, sketch comedy group. Um, that I've seen a bunch of sketches from 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 way back in the day. Um, you guys know me; always down for for the new horror movies that are coming out. This one looks kind of like what if Airbnb goes bad? Maybe a, a, a dash of supernatural, and I'm here for it. Sure, why not? Air well, and I've heard the B twist of this movie is that somebody is turning Justin Long into a walrus in the basement. <laughs> That's Tusk 2, okay? Uh, that's also that's happening. Air, air blubber and barbarian. <laughs> By the way, I've rented an Airbnb where it went wrong, and it was very scary, so I th it passes. Good premise. So you can relate. I can relate. Air yeah. barbarian uh, coming to theaters this Friday. I rented an Airbnb that I did for the music shoot for Positive NDA. I'm a musician, Midnight Satire. G Google it. Google it. Uh, but uh, the, the Airbnb that we shot the film in, we were, I mean, actually me and my fiance were going to stay there and um, there was like locked doors and there was a, there was curtains and you pulled it back and there was like a a room that wasn't accessible and it had rat shit on the floor and we were like we got to get the fuck out of here um, it was it was very oh and it smelled like bleach oh so, wow yeah it was very That's scary. not a good sign it was very scary so it was good it was a good location for the shoot we kind of did like a horror thing but uh yeah no no i i get i i vibe with the vibes as the kids say all the time <laughs> back to you brian so yeah that's barbarian that'll be in theaters this friday uh something that'll something else that'll be in theaters this friday is brahmastra part one shiva so this is a hindi fantasy adventure film written and directed by ayan Mukherjee, and is intended to serve as the first in a trilogy as part of its own cinematic universe called the Astraverse. Astraverse. Um, the premise of this is our main character, Shiva, is a DJ who learns about a strange connection he has with the element of fire, which may or may not tie in to these ancient weapons of power that may be guarded by people who protect these weapons of power it seems absolutely insane giant it's um it's called a fantasy here it looks like it's got romance elements as well very much kind of a multi-genre film um with movies like rrr becoming kind of like uh smash uh surprise successes in the west i'm excited to see another movie coming uh to hit a wide release in theaters over here that seems like it could um serve the same sort of audiences who are enjoying um, things like RRR. And I know in our area, um, locally, in my local AMC has played a lot of um, Bollywood and other films for a little while now, just because of the, the population in this area. Um, but really exciting to see this sort of stuff go wide. Christian, I know you're laughing. These This sort of movie is very uh, broad and huge. Uh, intentionally obviously over the top some might say no i um, love it i love a unique premise you know having a dj that has magic cool awesome i'm here i, I laughed in okay, joy okay it was yeah. a joyous laugh of that sounds wacky sounds fun 
Yeah. So that um, that'll be in theaters this Friday. That's Ramastra Part One Shiva. Lastly, in terms of movies, we have End of the Road coming to Netflix this Friday. Um, this follows recently widowed mom, Brenda, who fights to protect her family during a harrowing road trip when a murder and a missing bag of cash plunge them into danger. This stars Queen Latifah and Chris Ludacris Bridges, as well as Bo Bridges. Um, and this movie looks like a lot of fun. The cast kind of seems like the, the main pull here. It's the sort of movie that you've probably seen something like this before. It doesn't look like they're necessarily breaking any um, barriers in terms of what the movie is doing, but it's on Netflix, it's accessible. And uh, yeah, that'll be out this Friday, um, end of the road. All right, lastly, but not least, we have Splatoon 3 coming out this Friday to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is the third in the Splatoon series. This game has competitive online multiplayer alongside a story-driven single-player mode. Um, my good friend Peter, who I've mentioned on the podcast a good deal, we have a currently on hiatus other podcast called Adaptations that you could check out a few episodes of if you'd like to check that out. I've seen him and a couple of my other friends play hours of Splatoon, this game where you basically have giant paint rollers and fight for territory with your paint throughout the course of different types of levels. This is one of the games that, um, of many in Splatoon. As, as people know, I don't play a lot of video games, but when something relatively big is coming out, I like to mention it. Um, Christian, it sounded like you had a little bit of history with Splatoon. Uh, Christian, games uh, journalist for the Popaholics here. And, yes, uh, right. Yeah, I've actually never played Splatoon. I don't know why I nominated myself to talk about this, but I do know a lot about nice. it. And it's uh, what's interesting about it is it's a boxed release that is um, a multiplayer game primarily, right? There's a story mode, but it's mostly about playing with your friends. And um, I hear it addresses some of the multiplayer issues that they've had. Nintendo's not known for their multiplayer games and their live services, uh, but this is one of their like big heavy hitters for their platform. Uh, they mix things up. I believe this game is going to have a different number of people versus people. Like uh, the, the the it was like three on three before, and now it's like four on four or five on five or something. So they changed that up a bit, and you can actually play with your friends and be on the same and be on their team. So there's a little bit more agency with selection. But it's an interesting time for multiplayer games because most multiplayer games are free. Uh, that is like the trend: is that um, in order to build a big user base and have a thriving community of people playing and a diversity of skill sets, you need to breach a broad audience. So game developers have learned to make them free. This is not free. This is a box release. So I'm interested to see how successful it is. Splatoon is loved by many including Peter, apparently, and uh, was in, in, in see if Nintendo's magic can keep it uh, without having to be free, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like, in a year, Splatoon 3 is, like, free to play, and, like, Nintendo's just like, oh, yeah, that's, we gotta do what everybody else does, so, we'll see. Uh, I've, I've still, to this day, I've never played Splatoon game, I've seen some stuff, it seems fun. The funny. game is super popular. Yeah. It's now one of Nintendo's most popular franchises. Yeah. Join yeah. the ranks. Um, so, I think this game's gonna do very well. Yeah, seeing it seeing it compete again, like that's the thing is like Nintendo's magic constantly having to compete with industry trends. Uh, I think is a really interesting dynamic, and and you does Splatoon three bring enough new to the table? From what I've heard, it does it does not particularly bring a whole lot new. But again, Chris, the passion passionate fan base is definitely uh, possibly there. Support it, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, Splatoon three that'll be available for the Switch this Friday. And that will wrap it up for the news this week. Brian, it's so wacky. Thanks for bringing that news. Before we get into our next section, which is quick hits, in which we're going to review uh, 3,000 Years of Longing, we had a giveaway. Chris, tell the folks at home what we're giving away, how we're doing it. Christian, we're giving away a digital 4K copy of the original Predator film. Brian? Yeah. I was calling for that. Excellent. <laughs> I saw it. We vibed. We vibed. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who entered the contest. To enter, all you had to do was go over to our YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and then comment on any of the videos that we uploaded during the month of August, our Predator Month. Uh, and it is time to take the entrance and uh, select randomly with this fantastic name randomizer over here who the winner 
it, of even the though 4K digital for copy, those watching, it, will it looks like he's lying. But there is a generator uh, <laughs> that he has. It's on mechanical. The That's I, Chris. You went to great lengths. <laughs> like, it's very real. It's a you going to turn? He bought a here. bingo uh, <laughs> selector. <laughs> And get all their eat. Eat, er, eat, all right. I don't know why you had to put all their names on gold flakes. You want some? Uh, you want some? Uh, the drum? The drum playing? Fast. Please. Uh, all right, here we go. We're spinning it. And it is broken down. The it's mechanically is. failed. Uh, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> and the winner is David Hangelbrock. Hangelbrook. Appreciate. <laughs> Congratulations, you are the winner of the 4K digital copy of Predator. We'll be reaching out to you to make sure that you get your code, and we hope you enjoy the film. Thank hey, you. Hey, David, you're our biggest fan, and we're so excited that he you... He really is, he to really be honest. Is. Yeah, it's undeniable. And yeah. honestly, you know, speaking on behalf of the entire pod... I'm excited, dude. I'm excited, dude. I'm excited, dude, dude. I'm excited, dude. I'm excited, dude. I'm excited, dude. Take that. I'm excited, dude, dude. I'm excited, dude. Dude, I'm excited. And we invite you to Sorry. keep listening to the pod. We may have a lot of these giveaways to come. Uh, so uh, you, you We two. have many digital codes waiting so to many be given away. A vault. Thank you, everyone, for for submitting comments for this. Uh, thank you to David for being a loyal listener for so long as well. Um, really appreciate everyone yeah, yeah. Who, who's involved here. Second contest he's won. David getting in there, hacking the Matrix. It's very exciting. He knows. Look, he, he, he learns the rules, and he plays fairly, and he plays... Plays to win. Rules that we've set. Plays to well, win. Is, yeah. Okay. I don't think David's won before. His brother has won. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Then congratulations. Yeah. Sorry, I get those Hunglebrook uh, brothers mixed up all the time. They're uh, they're the uh, they're the <laughs> they're the understudies for the uh, Winkleboss twins. So I always oh, get confused with them. Uh, and uh, but this is very exciting. I've met David. I met David. Uh, you came to one of my shows, right? Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. 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 Very sweet guy. I couldn't think of a better guy to give it to. True fan. Uh, very excited. Chris, thank you for uh, putting that together. And I, I think I have the code, so I think I have to send it to you so you can send it to David. Very cool. Now, normally, Quick Hits is the part of the show where we bring you the latest of what we've all been consuming individually or collectively, but we all agreed to watch one film this week, and that film is George Miller's 3,000 Years of Longing. The wrong... Wrong way, Christian. 3,000 years of longing. My name is Alethea. My story is true. I am a solitary creature by nature. I have no children, no siblings, no parents. I did once have a husband. If there is fate, who can say? But in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, I chose a memento. I like it. Whatever it is, I'm sure it has an interesting story. So, what would you wish for? What is your heart's desire? I do have a question. What does one do with three wishes? You'll see. That is from the trailer of 3,000 Years of Longing, directed by George Miller, written by George Miller and Augusta Gore, adopted from the 1994 short story The Jinn in the Nightingale's Eye by A.S. Byatt, score by Tom Halkenbarg, the cinematography by John Seal, the budget of 80, <laughs> the budget of $60 million. Uh, it grossed, uh, as of this recording, $4.2 million, which, boys, as you know, is... Uh, I'm gonna do like the mad money thing. <laughs> boss, <laughs> boss, hit the red button, go nuts. Yeah, no, it's 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 ultimately sad for a lot of reasons. We'll, we'll can I can I say something while we're talking about what yeah. the movie's made so far? For sure, our listeners and viewers just saw the trailer for this movie. I don't think MGM knew how to market this movie because that trailer kind of markets the movie as like a comedy, but it's by no means that. Uh, well, so I mean, it, there are comedic it, it elements. It definitely is funny. It is it funny. Is it's funny. definitely funny. It's admittedly but, a hard movie 
to market as we'll, we'll talk absolutely about. I, I do think it's a it's a it's an interesting flick but I, uh, you know it has the cl- it has a cloud atlas problem you know it has this very big broad story about stories thing and stuff so but i admit not I a, do not a great trailer market. yeah it, it, it's yeah. not exactly what the movie the vibe of the movie for sure yeah no it's, and it's, it's weird for a lot of reasons we'll we'll talk about um but you know compared to mad max fury road which grossed uh different demographic admittedly but grossed hundreds of millions of dollars stars what should have done in the trailer is have someone say i think the easiest way for us to tell this story is in the form of a trailer um <laughs> yeah it should have been ama- yeah no no I- that would have been cool <laughs> brian you're hired. Hire me. <laughs> you should market this podcast. From the man that brought you Babe, Pig in the City, and Happy Feet. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, apologize. I, I, do, I do actually think that plays into how hard this film is to market, uh, given George Miller's, like, crazy career. They're just like, he's great. <laughs> They're like, he's a great director. Trust us. We promise. Uh, it stars a uh, very talented Academy Award winning actors, such as Tilda Swinton, Idris Elba, uh, Amita Lau. Uh, Berko Goldare, uh, Matteo Bocelli, King Golder, and uh, many more. And uh, we're going to do some non-spoiler thoughts. We'll probably spend a little bit more time in non-spoiler, um, being that this is a newer movie, and then go into spoiler and talk about our final uh, thoughts and stand-up moments and all that stuff. So let's start. Uh, let's let, let's start with the uh, the plot of this movie, um, which, you know, I'm, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I didn't watch the trailer, as I, I normally don't. And I went in kind of blind, and I really enjoy the experience that way. So, if you really do want a, you know, un- unsullied opinion, I-, I do. I do think it's a great way to enjoy this film. But essentially, Tilda Swinton, it, her job, Christian explains the plot. Tilda Swinton's job is to um, uh, talk about mythology and storytelling, and she herself finds herself in the middle of a fantastical story involving Idris Elba, who plays basically a genie. And uh, she's got to navigate through uh, whether or not she's going to talk about wishes and shit. You know, that's the movie. And that's essentially it. They talk to each other in a room for a long time. And that's it's most- a bottle film. It's, it's a bottle. Oh, Brian. Oh, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a bottle film. Uh, but we'll, we'll start with uh, we'll start with Chris, because I think I think our uh, I'm going to spoil a little bit about our opinions. Chris is like, ah, pretty good. Brian's like, ah, OK. And I'm like. I think I'm in love with this film. So we'll start with Chris, who has who has a kind of a middle of the road opinion. Not to spoil your thoughts too much. I don't guys. think it's a middle of the road opinion. I very much enjoyed this movie, and not to spoil your opinions, Christian, but was also almost moved to tears oh, by shit. the end of Let's this fist movie. bump through the Zoom. Come on. Yeah. No. No. Other there way. There we go. Oh, on my screen, it's you got to go the other way. Oh well. Good podcasting. Boom. There we go. Oh, that's going to look so good, though. You'll be proud to do that. Anyway, your thoughts on 3,000 Years of Longing. I really enjoyed this movie. I'd only seen the first trailer, so I, I mean, I was expecting the visuals of the film, but I wasn't exactly expecting uh, the narrative. This movie, as Christian mentioned, Tilda Swinton plays a narratologist. She, her profession is to read stories and fairy tales and assess how those stories impact us as humans why we create those stories to justify certain things that are taking place in our physical world very much in line with the thing that i have always been obsessed with my entire life which is mythology and lore and why we create the monsters and heroes that we do you know so right off the bat i was like i think i might be in love with this film because it truly is a love letter to the art of storytelling but the movie is so much more than that. It's a it's a story about love and love lost. It's a story about the the fallible nature of storytelling and how uh, truths can be twisted and histories changed. It's about you know what all and as the movie explains, what all essentially genie or jinn or wish making. Uh, fairy tales are about which is the cautionary tales of selfishness and making selfish wishes and the repercussions of those wishes so it's doing an insane amount Uh, and that might end up being uh, to the film's detriment at some points but I think the film is visually beautiful the audio mix 
if you have a chance to see this in theaters, I highly recommend it. It's mixed incredibly well. Tom Holken, uh, Holkenborg's score is beautiful. Um, and, and all around, it's just an incredibly interesting film that isn't getting enough love. I could watch Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton talk to each other, and I did watch them talk to each other for almost two hours, but I, I could have watched them talk to each other for so much longer. They're both captivating, and their chemistry is so interesting, especially as it progresses through the film. But uh, I, I have to say, I really enjoyed the experience. Um, most of the movie is one thing, and then it kind of transitions to something else, I would say in the third act of the film almost, latter latter half of the second act. Uh, and that I think may be a little jarring. I haven't read a lot of the critique online and, and how people feel about this movie, but at least in my experience, the transition was a bit jarring and I kind of wish we went back to what the movie was in, in the first like hour 15. It's like an extended but, epilogue. Yes, you know? exactly, exactly. But I have to say, uh, you know, despite that criticism, I still very much enjoyed the entire movie. Very cool. Brian, you weren't as hot on this film, but what did you think overall of 3,000 Years of Longing? So I pretty much agree with everything that Chris said. I mean, there's so much great happening here. And I think conceptually what it's trying to do, I'm very much on board for. Um, as you said, it's a story, um, a cautionary tale about wish stories that is in itself a, a story about wishes and this kind of um almost like a chess match back and forth between someone who feels like they know all the pitfalls of this and someone who has been through it all and maybe almost um sometimes even the um the source of the original where this original myth and one of them how do you say this some of the some of the tropes that come along with these may have even been inspired by some of the stories like that the that progenitor of the genre with. basically exactly yeah. exactly um and just getting into what jinn are um uh, physically or um how how they exist and the lore behind things and playing around with that all that stuff is really cool i think ultimately and i think it is speaking to kind of the part of the movie that you were saying chris I don't really buy our main character's decision to do something at some point. It feels like we all kind of know um, why this decision uh, should or shouldn't be made. And it felt a little bit kind of like, all right, so we know where the movie's going from here. And at that point I was kind of just like, okay. And I think the f I, it didn't hit me emotionally for some reason. I enjoyed them together and I wasn't bored by the movie at all. I did think it was visually interesting. Although some of the CG felt a little bit um, questionable questionable definitely yeah but the um, idea behind them was is very inventive and the framing of everything is great so yeah um it, do, it doesn't uh for me at least it doesn't distract from the vision i'm not disagreeing that right. it's not all like perfect but uh the vision of it is so good and there's so much good filmmaking happening it just seems like a time Thing, especially on a sixty million dollar budget, I think for a sixty million dollar, very effects heavy film, I think it looks pretty pretty damn good. But continue. Oh yeah, Brian. and the scope of this movie, considering it is kind of a bottle movie, the money is shown at times, and, um, at other times, even though, and I wasn't totally taken out of this movie. I I, I am going to be the coldest on this, but this is an easy recommend for me. You know, this, I really enjoyed this movie. I think um, what it has to say about storytelling, as you've laid out, Chris, is just very much up my alley. And I, I don't think it would work as a whole movie, but I think the intro of the movie and how we're led into what ultimately becomes the plot is really, really strong. And the movie kind of just takes off and it is really uh, gets you there before it slows down and becomes more kind of, um, a vignette heavy, right? Yeah, I um, I I like these movies. Uh, historically, I'm just a fan of weird uh, swings, and this is that. I, I think that this movie, if it was, you know, PG or PG thirteen, had a Disney exec behind it, I think is like a sleeper hit for the year, you know. But but because it's adult. And because it's weirdly paced and because they make some really interesting decisions and because it is violent and graphic in, in certain ways, 
it just it's an impossible movie to sell and i love when movies that are impossible to sell get made and uh, we can enjoy them and it has some rough edges i i'm a huge fan of cloud atlas which is historically panned for bad prosthetics and some like weird design choices but i i love i i just tend to love movies that really fucking go for it and this is like a modern fairy tale slash like love story that you know again the the edges are so rough to it that i can't deny people that nitpick stuff but i'm like what fucking movie is like this what movie is doing anything close to this this year with such confidence like it is a very confident movie in the way that uh, again the bottled nature of it where two characters are talking but it transitions between the the vignettes the past between them talking and they're it's about storytelling and they're telling stories and there are moments when that character that's in the story the film will cut and they're in the same position talking in the room and then it cuts back and forth between what happened and it is so much about all the things that it's about that i don't know i fucking love it and there's so much that is trying to say about um how i think the, the message that really carried for me was that storytelling in its nature can die as specifics and information becomes like more apparent and that theme to me rang so true alongside the true love uh you can't make somebody love you message and uh, you know ultimately like i i don't know it, there's so much going on but it still worked for me and, but I get the descent. I walked out of the theater. There was, there, again, I, I saw, I, I didn't say this on, on the pod, but it, my theater was actually pretty full of people because it was like a discount day at the movie theater. And uh, I was walking out and I, I was very high on the film and someone behind me said, the ending of the movie was fucking stupid. Like literally just said that. And that was a general audience right. reaction. Wow. And I came away going like, I didn't expect the movie to, like I, I didn't expect it to end the way that it did and it gave me like a sense of um i don't spoil too much but it gave me a sense of like hope and of 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 love and our ability to tell stories and stay together and like it, it was oddly a movie that was clearly made during the pandemic it came away like exceedingly hopeful and um i just came away reinvigorated with um a love for my partner a love for kind of the things that bring us together as people all these big broad concepts and um yeah, I think the performances are great, uh, and and I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm in love with this movie. It was really charming to me. It was really sweet, but yet adult, and um, yeah, I think it was funny. I laughed. Uh, it had me at the edge of my seat the entire time as far as where the story would go, and uh, yeah, clunky, but fuck yeah. I, I like this movie a lot. <laughs> I'm weird. I don't know. Uh, I feel weird for like liking this movie so much. It seems to get no, like this is great. All of us really like uh, well, not not really like all of us like this movie. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think you should feel weird considering that like all of us think it's a good film. But did we find it like? Did we find it sweet? I found it sweet. I found it sweet. Absolutely, in a weird way, I you know? I completely agree with you and felt similar emotions walking out of the theater. I went to see it. So I too went to see it on the same day that you did at a Regal theater near me. It was discounted. Uh, but in my area, the demographic is mostly retired people. So I was by myself in a movie theater in the afternoon with like a couple of older couples watching this movie and, and one couple that was probably closer to my age. But walking out of the film, you could feel exactly what you're talking about, which is like this sense of hopefulness and love and just like kind of being excited about about life, you know? So I don't I don't think... I think that a lot of people probably had the reaction that you witnessed at your showing, but I think there are are a select few group of people that feel as we do about this movie. Yeah, I mean, it's just charming in almost every way, and and magical and unexpected. The the the, the links it goes to show this, it it kind of it kind of comes across very as is stoic at the beginning but then like the the leaps that it takes the fantasy that's that's really embraced there's a scene that i'll talk about in my favorite moments where there's just a musical piece that almost brought me to tears and it's it's beautiful and outlandish 
and uh, the set design's crazy, and there's a lot of like crazy decisions, and it's it's fu- like at the end of the day, it's fucking weird. I mean, there's like horse people and shit. It's 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 nuts, but it was kind of like I don't know. It was it was very uplifting and very sweet, and uh, yeah, there, there there's a ton of moments like that, and I feel like uh, Brian, this is like a David Lynch moment where like I'm really vibing with George Miller and where he's at. <laughs> and, and no, I I want to say I I totally agree, and like this idea of. I don't want to get into specifics about the movie, but yeah. it's like a movie reminding you that magic exists in the world, mm-hmm, you right. know, and it's sometimes it's hiding right in front of your face. Um, but yeah, no. And this is the type of messaging that I'm a hundred percent here for. And this is what stories are about and what, you know, being human is about being able to think about life this way. Um, so it does excite me. I think, um, partially maybe why I'm not as hot is there's ideas that are hinted at here that I've maybe seen fleshed out conceptually better in other projects, kind of on the horror side of things to some degree, Hmm. but there's so much good happening here. And this is a movie that I could definitely see myself coming back to and maybe even liking more on, on second watch. Um, But yeah, like I said, even being the least hot on this, this is an easy recommend for, for me. Well, and I also think the movie is deserving of multiple watches because there are elements yeah. of the picture that kind of turn the entire film on its head and make you question like the reality of what's actually taking place over the course of the movie. There's something that happens at the beginning as well as a sequence at the end that make you uh, question, like I said, question the reality. I'm trying to be as vague as I possibly well, can. Be Tom Cruise is stuff. dead when he goes up in the, the exactly. Dark Star. <laughs> He dies right. the, after the first ten minutes of the film. Fantasy, exactly. Yep, you nailed it. Yeah, you know yeah, what we're no, doing no, it's, here. It's, it's, good, it's good. It's good theory you got there. I think people should just die. I don't don't watch the movie. Just dive into that theory, and I think you'll get uh, just as good of an experience as going to the theater. Anyway. Everyone should go watch this because George Miller. Um, even though you know, I I don't think it's a perfect movie. I hope this man continues making movies because I agree that the the swings being taken here, I it tries to do some historical stuff that kind of I'm not sure how I feel about that either. I haven't dug deep into the historicity. I felt a little bit like I'm not sure how I feel about this while watching. Brian, but, you just got to not think about it too much. I'm going to be very know, honest with I you because I also <laughs> went like the Ottomans and then it's going in, and I was like, no, stop, it's not. I know. I know. So that's, I think. <laughs> I think we should just be happy for representation, you know, whether it's accurate or not, you know, it's, you know, it's a very diverse cast that's, that's happening. So that's, that's a solid, that's a solid thing. Uh, okay. Before we go into spoilers, there's a lot, Brian, that I'm very interested in spoilers, like specifically about maybe what made you a little cooler on the film. Before going to that, I do want to talk about how this film started. Did you all, I mean, Chris, I'm assuming you had to, cause we saw it in the same theater to have the opening with George Miller just going, yeah. yes. Thanks for coming to the movies. Holy fuck, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> all 10,000 of you. Yeah, all 10,000. <laughs> it was it was it was very sweet and then it was also very sad because it made me go like extremely sad. It, it was just like a big thank you appears and it's like thank you for giving a shit and you're like, "Yeah, it I reminded hope. me that I didn't get that from Tom Cruise before Top Gun and I was How dare numb. he? No, it, was just, it ended with him going. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. Any other thoughts before we go into spoilers? Let's do it. All right. Spoil alert for 3,000 Years Longing starting now. All right. Um, so yeah, I want I want to kind of start with the um, with the thread that I left there. But Brian, w- what are some of the elements that you feel are really deterring from this film overall, really elevating it for you? The, the, that's the thing. I, I there weren't really like moments in the movie where I'm like, okay, this isn't working necessarily. The one thing that kind of soured me was her her wish ultimately, and how kind of obvious it was. The the first wish. The, the, the wish to make him love her. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it seems like someone who the whole movie prior to this is making all these uh, uh, arguments and obvious, um, very familiar with all the stories. And maybe 
this ties in with some other folk uh, and folklore and myth mythology, but this is like a classic story about true love and, and things that she would be familiar with um, as her character. So it just seemed a little bit cheap. And so I'm, I was kind of just waiting for the shoe to drop after that. So it kind of just took away from being caught up in the rest of the movie, which very much kind of all over the place, not sure where it's going and working really well in how their kind of pseudo argument discussion about it all is morphing well into the stories that are being told and the mythology that has happened in the past. And I think up until that point, it's working really well. And then it kind of just ran into a little bit of a roadblock there for me. And I never, I think that's kind of where emotionally I, 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 I left the characters and wasn't caught up in how it ended, even though I do agree that it's hopeful and sweet how how things do play out. So it wasn't necessarily like, oh, X, Y, Z moment were just bad, took me out of it, you know? It just, unfortunately, it didn't fully click with me, even though I saw so much that was working and that I liked. I totally get that. It, it makes you know, total sense that if you do not buy that turn, that the, the, the movie can break down pretty horribly yeah. after that, for sure. Chris, you're gonna say. I think I think that first I I agree with you in a way, in that the character that Tilda Swinton is playing, Althea, uh, that's presented to us prior to that taking place doesn't seem like a character that would make this type of wish because on the outside the person that she's presenting is someone who is very comfortable in her loneliness. However, there are several instances over the course of the first two acts of the film where we're presented with evidence to the contrary. And despite this kind of like shield that she's put up for the rest of the world because of circumstance, uh, she's really just trying to protect herself from having to think about it too much. And I think the Jin from the beginning is kind of in on that. Once he knows the type of person that she is, he's had a lot of experience with granting people's desires and just learning a little bit about this woman. I, it, at least what the movie's presenting to me, it seems like he's not surprised when she makes that initial wish because of the conversation they've been having over the course of the last, you know, hour, hour 15. Right. And, you know, the, the kind of tropey nature of that decision also kind of ties into the reality bending of the film that I was talking about earlier in that we get to a point at the end of the movie where it seems as though the entire thing is just a fairy tale. And despite Alethea saying that it is a true story, we're presented with evidence that she wrote an entire book about it, a fairy tale. And we are probably just witnessing the events of that particular story, which also tie in to what I was saying earlier about uh, narratives being fallible in nature or stories being fallible in nature because they're always spun or, or turned in a way to make them uh, more accessible or present a specific theme. So like what we're watching over the course of the film is unreliable uh, because we're most likely watching a fairy tale. There are things in the movie that I still haven't quite pieced together like the incident that happens in the airport at the very beginning. I'm not quite sure how that ties into things. Uh, maybe you guys have some type of insight, but I think overall the entire film is most likely the book that she has written about this experience warped in ways that fairy tales are typically warped, you know? Yeah, but does it like engross you and engage you and have you understand the thing? Absolutely, kind of, just kind of, as a good fairy be... tale should. <laughs> and is there truth in it, right? Like, I feel like it's kind of pretentious to say that, but ultimately, to a point, Christian kind of, or I can't remember what, which one of you said it, but something about the more fact heavy you get. It yeah, it was Christian. Your per which is when she starts definitely off a message of goes, the movie. I that I'm going to tell it like a story because, like, we're really just trying to give you a feeling. So I kind of want to talk about why it works for me. Yeah, there's this game they're playing the whole time. But he ultimately needs something from her. And that's when it comes to like the movie ultimately is about storytelling and about love. And this like classic trope of how love transcends. It's a very like common tropey kind of thing. But the way the movie goes about it to me feels fresh and feels very alive and really connected with me because, you know, he needs her to set him free. So she he needs to understand her like desires. So the way in which he tells 
the stories and the way he orders it and the way that he uh, like holds back and he dramatically waits to talk about at the at the very the very last vignette is is about a woman that's very similar to her, which is like mm-hmm. someone who is isolated and didn't find comfort in in men uh, because of past experiences and she craves knowledge. Like he saves that story for her in his ultimate goal of setting himself free, whether or not he knows that that's because she really desires love. Like there are signs that the film builds up to that that's what she needs. And yes, he is kind of playing a game to get that, but that makes sense because that's his desire. That's his desire. Right. Her desire is obviously to not act to actually find somebody that can fulfill her desire for, for knowledge and for, for like storytelling as a whole like like he is kind of the perfect mate for her because he is the stuff of legends and she studies legends so there is this kind of perfect true love between them but also could never like in so many ways that love stories are told could never be permanent and that's expressed in the film and i just found that beautiful and i i bought it because even though there's a part of it where you're like oh i kind of see it coming and and does he really love her? Like at the end of the day, yes, because he was able to meet her desires and match that, and obvi- obviously proved it by respecting her and out outside, like just as much as he loved any previous mortal before him. Right? There's there's there, there's a beautiful uh, game they're playing that also turns into a mutual appreciation, which is like what flirting and relationships are it's this it's like men men going to women being like there's a reason that i talk to women (laughs) but i also like need to play the game that you're at if i seek your adoration based on her circumstance and like that plays out very similar to the way that um a lot of relationships do you know heterosexual otherwise like there's this there's this level of you need me i need you that is just the primal reason that two humans connect and then the way they express that throughout i found it worked even though it is like a little telegraphed and it's a little like convenient to me i'm like it makes sense for where these characters are at and and um where they inevitably end up and the the problems that after you've played the game and you're in a relationship how does like he moves into her place and it's like He's like, I'm not from here, and this like actually hurts me to be here. But I love you enough that they have to make a compromise for how it works. Like that to me is 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 despite the fact him being like an immortal being, like it just shows the difference in how partnerships and, and love develop. So so that that's a very long winded way of of, of of kind of stating how why it kind of worked for me, even though it seems kind of structured in an unnatural way. It doesn't seem like a true profession of love, but I think that's also, the film talks about that, where she goes, ultimately goes, I'm holding you here because I wish you to be here. Um, so ultimately, it, it, it inevitably works for me. I want to shout out the ongoing, I don't know if I, it's a gag exactly, but the progression of his bottle being captured in different places for different mm-hmm. periods of time is just an incredible running bit that um and how he how we see him kind of pull people towards the, pull people towards it and things like that how all of that progressed i was completely very there interesting for it. and i really, I, I really like just that element and how it kind of was this gag about like oh he's in the ocean now he's got to wait until <laughs> the sea levels change or something <laughs> like shit um really really great just um, yeah, it highlights the way showing that, his who his character is and how that must be in such a simple, like, clear way. Yeah, and how history is so much of like just times that like things just lined up and the random chance yeah. of events that happen. Um, yeah, him being God, so many times when he's like when he's stuck underneath the 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 floorboard, like the concrete slab, <laughs> the tile. And it's not until one of the uh, Ottoman emperor's brother, like his brother's concubines that are like all these really big women sits on it. And then falls on it. And yeah. then he like, and, and you kind of think, I don't know, based on, uh, at least for me, based, based on, uh, you know, like, I don't know, external judgment of like, Oh, she'll be really excited. Cause maybe she can wish for like, beauty that is uh more accepted or like she'll be in more vulnerable and oh, she let's let's totally pause right there takes... i think her beauty was very accepted in that court <laughs> Agreed. Um, Agreed. judging by what everyone was interested in there 
<laughs> yeah, I love that interaction though between between Idris Elba and that woman because of how panicked he is oh, yeah, from yeah. being invisible to the world for such a long time, showing that like even a jinn being an immortal being, something that's timeless, can exhibit human nature. You know, it's it's really it's really well executed. And I like all the idea, like the idea that he, uh, the Jin dream when they're awake, and that's like a thing he unlocks. So like cool. Brian, I thought of you immediately of of a concept that you'd be interested in. You know, something again that maybe points to the stuff that's not explored as much as you'd like, but just this like throwaway concept of so many great ideas. Oh, very, very 100%. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so let's transition into uh, some standout moments. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. What are some stand standout moments from 3,000 Years of Longing? I, I think, you know, to be perfectly honest, there aren't any moments in particular that are like, this is the moment. But honestly, the entire piece as a whole, I just found to be fantastic. You know, I, I like everything that's going on. George Miller's visuals, the these kind of high-minded concepts that we just mentioned, like the dreaming while you're awake. I love the design of Idris Elba's gin. All the coloration that goes into that costume is is really interesting. And like, it, I know for especially for a gin or a genie, it's tough to like to bring something like that to life in a new and interesting way, considering that mythology has been around for such a long time. But I think they found a way to do it. Uh, it's just overall a, a really great and unexpected movie. Yeah, I like the part where he came out of the bottle and he uh, sang the classic, <laughs> uh, you've never met a friend like me. It's like, it was a good homage. <laughs> uh, Brian, Incredible. any standout moments? I kind of um, talked about it a little bit earlier, but I was, I think one of the things that immediately gripped me was when... Um, Althea is giving her speech in the middle, in the beginning of the movie about mythology. And she's going back and forth with her, her colleague and coworker and how we get, it's kind of like a, a horror movie scene and the, the tone of the movie really changes from there, but her introduction into within the context of the story we're being told, at least like the supernatural world exists mm -hmm. in some capacity. It, you can't deny it. And her having like an episode, that kind of kicked that off. I thought that was a really great entry point. That was the, the thing that hooked me into this movie initially. Um, so that one, I think that's one of the scenes that stands out for me. Yeah, no, I I, I love the way that it, <laughs> it, it seems like a, maybe a subtle jab between the state of like where mythology is and storytelling where she's <laughs> it's got like Marvel and DC up there. Um, and then she- I don't then, think it was a subtle jab at all. I, I think it was an acknowledgement of our current mythology, sure. which is comic books. Yeah. No, no, I, I I think so too, but also there's, I don't know, there's, it seems to be a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of like, as she's doing that, an old ghost appears, and it's kind of like, you know, not the thing that she's talking about. And Let's don't... keep in mind, George Miller was set to direct a Justice League movie. Yeah, he but loves he comic books. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Is, is Tom Hulkenborg the guy who did um, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Am I misremembering this? Oh, I don't remember. Uh, Chris, you look, look into that. I'm sorry. I, I know Zimmer did the Superman stuff. Can't remember who they got to do the do the Justice League. Um, I'll I'll talk about uh, speaking of music. I'll talk about one of my favorite scenes I had mentioned earlier. The scene in Sheba's court uh, with him and every guitar player knows this feeling of a string breaking. And it hurting you in some oh, way. Oh, yeah. And you think it's ruined, and then he starts playing again, and then there's this, like, the the, the lyle that he's playing on, or whatever, the lute. Um, it's a three-stringed instrument. It's not a lute, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's sort of a very primitive uh, string guitar instrument. And then there's, like, a hand that's part of the guitar, and then there's, like, these things inside these, uh, you know, trumpet... That is Groot. Trumpet thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it just was like this magical thing. And then she was got like uh, horse hair. Like she looks like a Clydesdale on her legs. And they're just like, yeah, that's going to be a sign of like royal blood. Because she's part a, gin. I had never heard this. Uh, in, I'm not super familiar with, with gin. But I had never heard this idea of um, of hair on the legs for gin. It's almost like centaur-esque. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was super. I didn't know that was a, there was an element of it. But to put that on screen, I'm like, that's a weird choice, and probably yeah. not what the probably one that's just going to distract people. But yeah, fuck it, put it in. There. 
um because they bring it back too they bring it back to the the ottoman um sultans um have like royal blood like uh you know gin blood and stuff it's a, yeah it's a sign of the the mixing of the genes you know between mortal and gin yeah so uh no that that that's a scene that i i love in the musical piece which um i need i need to look up and stuff is is beautiful it's a beautiful piece of music <laughs> that i was uh it's it's rare that there's something like that in a film that really like moves you and i, I found it a very moving piece of music uh that i thought was wholly uh kind of original and also very classical sounding i think christian i, I really appreciate you bringing that up because i think this is when i was emotionally closest to at least idris elba's character mm-hmm. seeing him so uh broken apart like it's like no one could could say no to this man after he's played this beautiful music for them, right? And just that kind of acceptance on some level. Oh, and bleeds uh, for it. It's so emo. It's great. Like literally mm-hmm. cuts his finger yes. and bleeds yes. all over his instrument. And then he's like, just quickly restrings it and then keeps going. I mean, that's like, that's, that's, yeah. uh-huh. it's, my, it's my chemical romance level shit. It's good stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, but you know, I, I also like, I, I know it's not explored as well, but the other thing I'll shout out is I know the epilogue's a little messy, but I love the idea uh, that the more spiritual aspects of what we see in, in the movie and him, uh, Idris Elba's character, just existing in the modern world is tough. Like, it's hard for him to exist with all the things that are happening in the electro... Like, they try to explain it with, like, a scientific reason. But the fact that the concept of him is harder to get across and is in decline because of the amount of information we send each other and like kind of the mystique and mystery of life and storytelling is ruined a little bit uh i I thought that was like a subtly very sweet thing especially she's um you know a story of storytelling and she falls in love with one of the greatest storytellers in in the world uh, who's this immortal character and he's literally being killed by 5g um it's like i don't know oddly compelling to me oh no absolutely 100 yeah. percent. conceptually this the idea of Jin. i think they they kind of say that they're on the electromagnetic spectrum mm-hmm. is kind of how they talk about it this is something that has kind of been delved into with ghost movies and stuff as well in the past but i love that idea i think they're described as being like um creatures of like subtle fire um, and thinking of that as kind of electricity is a very interesting idea. And I think a very astute one, maybe if, if we're talking about, um, overlapping realms of, of, of the world, which we do know exist and the potential for life on those different spectrums. Um, yeah, no, it's It's all really cool concepts. It really is. And then he says, I also love that they break down the, you know, which is like temporary, but concrete and physical and you can Mm -hmm. feel it. And fire is like a passion. It's like, uh, yeah. Combination of dust and fire. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Chris, you were saying. I I love that the movie breaks down the materialization of, of the stages that Jin take as they are like reforming themselves or, or becoming or coming into existence basically. So like it, Brian, it very, it, it reminded me of, of Alan Moore's swamp thing of the anatomy lesson and this idea of kind of forming and reforming i guess this is literally alchemy on some level but um yeah no um and see i feel like talking about it and the ideas are all there this is why it's uh i'm a little bummed that it was just not as well for me it's not the movie's introducing these really interesting elements of lore but that's not what the movie's about you know it's it's not going to take time to explain the the fictional science of of how these things are taking place. And it would probably be worse off if it did, to be honest, Agreed. right? Yeah. But I too really like the concepts. I think they're really interesting to talk yeah, about. Severe lack of portals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, too few portals. So uh, uh, let's uh, let's wrap our conversation about 3,000 Years of Longing with final thoughts. Brian, any final thoughts you want to share? I love stories. I love movies. I feel like George Miller and everyone involved in this feels the same. And I'm happy that they were able to make this. It's something that, like I said, even though it's not going to um, be my favorite movie of the year, it's definitely something that I'd come back to and could recommend to people who, um, again, the ideas in this are worth exploring, um, especially from, you know, we live in the United States. 
Um, there are obviously people of the Muslim faith here, but a lot of people outside of those who have recently watched uh, Miss Marvel, where Jin were also introduced, aren't familiar with the concept of Jin outside of, you know, the things like Genie in, in Disney movies and things like that. So kind of giving that uh, pseudo historical perspective on on this mythological uh, creature. It's it's great stuff and it's worthwhile and I'm happy it exists. Chris. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with all that, Brian. You know, the one of the reasons we started this podcast is because of our love of storytelling and uh, these wonderful narratives that have existed over the course of time. And we love talking about these particular things. Um, so I it makes perfect sense to me that this movie resonated with us in the way that it did. And I hope that over time, more people get to see this film uh, and enjoy it. Yeah, I do think that uh, it could end up being one of those, like, you know, cult, like, you got to see this film that you've never heard of. It feels like there's so many people that haven't seen it. I do feel like enough people would find it charming. Um, And, you know, it's full of hopeful moments. I didn't mention this, but you know part of what like charms me about the film is there's there's a a, in the later part of the film there's these neighbors that are like super bigots um you know they're kind of like oh we don't like all the immigrants in our country which is very much a thing in england right now and the united states and um how does tilda swinton convince them that they should give a shit about um uh, about people that are different than them uh, she feeds them their delicious food, which is certainly something that has um, definitely opened my eyes to, you know, the great things about diversity, which is there's some fucking really good food out there. And when you have something lovingly made by a different culture and you're like, oh, shit, you get down with this. This is delicious. And she actually introduces um, Idris Elba's character. They're kind of caught off guard and there's not really, you know, all your conjecture and stuff can't go very far if you hit yourself as a Idris handsome Elba. man i was gonna say he's a handsome like, man there's no <laughs> denying that man he's got like uh <laughs> he's got cut cauliflower ears going on though so you know he's, he's a little bit rough but uh yeah you d- eat some delicious melt in your mouth uh you know garbanzo bean pistachio smashed uh crispy uh croutons you know you're gonna be in love with any culture that delivers that experience to you so, you know, that's just one small thing. I found it a very, Man like... could put a plate together. My God. <laughs> I could. I could use a gin. An arrangement. Um, but I gotta be careful with my wishes. Um, but I think I would wish for Idris Elba to show up, uh, you know, nine times his actual size, like, bent over. What an exposed position that Idris Elba <laughs> finds himself in when he first gets released. He's, like, complete... He's, like, looking back at her, and he's like, Hey, what's up? And he's, like, this giant black ass in front of her and i'm like what is what a go- cool scene though so like cool him learning the language and and adapting yeah. to the situation Pulling einstein out and be like do you want to talk to einstein yeah. just like just put it back she's she, not okay and he just, and uh until swain's character goes no no you never want to meet your heroes i'm good <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no he's cool in my imagination i'm sure i don't want to meet him though um he was a man <laughs> from the early 1900s i'm sure he's a piece of shit <laughs> just put him back where he went <laughs> i know how this will turn out <laughs> anyway i love this movie i thought it was like uh, it's fun especially because i almost actually just watched dragon ball z and imax um i was like is this a better idea i saw the mixed reviews and i was like what if i just watched dragon ball z and then just told the guys that i didn't watch the movie what a delightful surprise that i had still might try to go catch the dbz and imax <laughs> Anyway, that's going to do it for 3,000 Years of Longing. Uh, yeah, you should see it. If you're this far, the chances are you probably haven't seen it. And chances are you're a pretty cool person. So I think you I think you would find something to enjoy out of it. Gentlemen, where can people find more of your work on the internet? Loyal listeners and viewers, you can find me on Twitter at Chris Conkling, talking about all things nerdy, television, movies, video games, comic books, collectibles. If it's nerdy, I'm talking about it. And you can find my writing on a monthly basis on carefulforspoilers.com. You can find me at True Popoholic. And you can find me in this messy room uh, wishing that Idris Elba showed up nine times the size, bent over, looking back at me, going, Make your wish, funny man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you can find my band at my night satire, make some music. Uh, augmented Reality is the new EP. And uh, you can find more of this podcast by searching in the show notes or in the, the video description. We have a link to read to all of our stuff. We got some really cool stuff planned, so stay tuned. The podcast is not dead, Brian. 
not murdered it yet. Brian and I are going to keep it alive. <laughs> You're going to get way less of uh, this asshole, and so you get a nice, refreshing taste of uh, Chris and Chris and Brian. And uh, then, uh, you know, we have a special, like, four-year thing planned, which should be fun, and then more cool things to come after that. Uh, we're going to close out this episode the way that we do, uh, which is with Christian's uh, TikTok of the week. He wants a woman who's soft, a woman who's receptive, a woman who's vulnerable. Yeah, but only vulnerable to the sun, because she's actually a super powerful vampire woman. And you came to slay her, and then you fight in battle, and she quite easily defeats you. And you look up at her, and you're like, your beauty is only rivaled by your power. And she's like, oh, And then you're like, what? And then she's like, gives you the amulet of power, because for whatever reason, despite her immense capability to just about whatever she wants, she sees something in you. And the amulet of power totally increases all of your base stats by 10. And you're like, what? This for me, though? And she's like, yeah, stupid, shut off. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and then you kiss on the lips for a little bit and she t- plays with your hair while you lay in her lap and she's like but you probably should go give me some men to feed on otherwise I'm probably going to eat you and you're like yeah totally totally yeah I'm not doing nothing <laughs>